The Riddle of the Circular Counters However obscure a mystery may be, there is always some point or circumstance which, if rightly interpreted, will lead to its solution. Even in those crimes which have never been elucidated, this point exists, only it has never been duly appreciated. It is his key clue, as I may call it, for which the detective first looks, and since few crimes, if any, are committed without some definite reason, it is most frequently found in the motive. His almost superhuman power of recognizing this key clue was the foundation of Christopher Quarles's success, and his solution of the mysterious burglaries which caused such speculation for a time was not the least of his achievements. Sir Joseph Maynard, the eminent physician of Harley Street, had given a small dinner party one evening. The guests left early, and soon after midnight the household had retired. Neither Sir Joseph nor Lady Maynard nor any of the servants were disturbed during the night, but next morning it was found that burglars had entered. They had got in by a passage window at the back, not a very difficult matter, and had evidently gone to the dining room and helped themselves to spirits from a tantalus which was on the sideboard. Three glasses, with a little of the liquor left in them, were on the table, and near them were some biscuit crumbs. There were several silver articles on the sideboard, but these had not been touched. The burglars appeared to have given all their attention to Sir Joseph's room, which was in a state of confusion. Two cupboards and every drawer had been turned out and the contents thrown about in all directions. A safe which stood in the corner had been broken open. It was a large safe, but of an old-fashioned type, presenting little difficulty to experts. In it, besides papers and about seventy pounds in gold in a canvas bag, Sir Joseph had a considerable amount of silver, presentations which had been made to him, and some unique specimens of the Queen Anne period. All this silver was upon the floor, also the bag of money intact. So far as Sir Joseph could tell, not a thing had been taken. Half a dozen cigarette ends had been thrown down upon the carpet, and a small box containing some round counters lay broken by the writing table. It looked as if the box had been knocked down and trodden on by mistake, for the counters were in a little heap close to the broken fragments. It appeared that the burglars must have been disturbed and had made off without securing their booty. This was the obvious explanation, but it did not satisfy me. I questioned Sir Joseph about his papers. Had he any document which, for private or public reasons, someone might be anxious to obtain? He said he had not, was inclined to laugh at my question, and proceeded to inform me that he had no family skeleton, had no part in any government secret, had never been in touch with any mysterious society, and had no papers giving any valuable details of scientific experiments upon which he was engaged. Of course, the thieves might have been disturbed, but there were certain points against this idea. No one had moved about the house during the night, so apparently there had been nothing to disturb them. The silver on the floor was scattered, not gathered together, ready to take away, as I should have expected to find it, and it looked as if it had been thrown aside carelessly, as though it were not what the thieves were in search of. And surely, had they left in a hurry, the bag of money would have been taken. Moreover, the cigarette ends and the dirty glasses suggested a certain leisurely method of going to work, and men of this kind would not be easily frightened. The cigarette ends puzzled me. They were of a cheap American brand, had not been taken from Sir Joseph's box, which contained only Turkish ones, and although they had apparently been thrown down carelessly, there was no ash upon the carpet nor anywhere else. They looked like old ends rather than the remains of cigarettes smoked last night. If my idea were correct, it would mean that they had been put there on purpose to mislead. I examined the three glasses on the dining room table. There was the stain of lips at the rim of one, but not of the other two. Only one had been drunk out of, and probably a little of the liquid had been emptied out of this into the other two. On inquiry, one of the servants told me that only a very little of the spirit had been taken. She also said there was only one biscuit left in the box last night, and it was there now. Therefore, a few crumbs from the box must have been purposely scattered on the tablecloth. This was the story I told to Professor Quarles and his granddaughter. I went to him at once, feeling that the case was just one of those in which his theoretical method was likely to be useful. By doing so, I certainly saved one valuable life, possibly more than one. That he was interested was shown by our adjournment to the empty room, and he did not ask a question until I had finished my story. "'What is the opinion you have formed about it, Wigan?' he said. "'I think there was only one burglar, but for some reason he thought it important 
that it should be believed there were more. A very important point and a reasonable conclusion, I fancy, said Quarles. If you are right, it narrows the sphere of inquiry, narrows it very much, taken with the other facts of the case. Exactly, I answered. There is a suggestion to my mind of amateurness in the affair. I grant the safe was not a difficult one to break open, but it had not been done in a very expert manner. The cigarette ends, the dirty glasses, and the biscuit crumbs seem to me rather gratuitous deceptions, and... Wait, said Quarles. You assume a little too much. They would have deceived nine men out of ten. You happen to be the tenth man. Amateur or not, we have to deal with a very smart man, so don't underestimate the enemy, Wigan. Assuming this to be the work of an amateur, to what definite point does it lead you? To this question, I replied. Did Sir Joseph Maynard burgle his own house? Why should you think so? His manner was curious. Then there is only his own statement that nothing has been taken. But supposing he wished to get rid of papers or of something else which was in his possession and for which he was responsible to others, burglary would be an easy way out of the difficulty. Would he not have robbed himself of something to make the affair more plausible? said Quarles. The amateur constantly overlooks the obvious, I answered. The professor shook his head. Besides, Wigan, if you wanted to suggest that some important document had been stolen, that is just the one thing he would mention. I think that would entirely depend on the man's temperament, Professor. That may be true, but we have also got to consider the man's character. Sir Joseph's standing is very high. Sudden temptation or necessity may subvert the highest character, I answered. You know that as well as I do. When I questioned Sir Joseph about his papers, his manner seemed curious, as I have said. He at once declared that he had no part in any government secret or mysterious society. Gratuitous information, you understand, not an answer to any direct question of mine, showing that the ideas were in his mind. Why? The explanation would be simple if he were the burglar of his own papers. I admit the argument is sound, Wigan, but it does not creep into my brain with any compelling influence. There was a link missing in the chain somewhere, and he looked at Zena. His often repeated statement that she helped him by her questions had never impressed me very greatly. When a mystery was cleared up, it was easy to say that Zena had put him on the right road, and I considered it a whim of his more than anything else. Still, I am bound to say that her seemingly irrelevant questions often had a curious bearing on the problem. It was so now. You did not seem interested in the broken box of counters, she said, turning toward her grandfather. I wonder, Wigan, is that the clue? Quarles said quickly. It creeps into my brain. The counters were in a heap, I said. As if they had fallen out of the box when it was broken? asked Quarles. No, that would have scattered them more. They were round and might have fallen over after having been put one upon another as one gathers coppers together when counting a number of them. Sir Joseph picked them up and put them on the writing table while he was talking to me. Did that strike you as significant? asked Quarles. I cannot say it did. The floor was covered with things, and I fancy they happened to be in his way. That was all. They are significant, Wigan, but I cannot see yet in which direction they lead us. We must wait. For the moment, there is nothing to be done. I had become so accustomed to Quarles jumping to some sudden conclusion that I was disappointed. I think I was prepared to find him a failure in this case. Naturally, I was not idle during the next few days, but at the end of them I had learnt nothing. Then the unexpected happened. On consecutive nights, two doctors' houses were burgled. The first was in Kensington. Dr. Wheatley had taken some part in local politics, which had made him unpopular with certain people, and he was inclined to consider the burglary one of revenge rather than intended robbery. Nothing had been stolen, but everything in his room was in disorder, and a small and unique inlaid cabinet with a secret spring lock had been smashed to pieces. Several cigarette ends were on the floor. The second was at Dr. Woods's in Edbury Street, an eminent surgeon and the author of one or two textbooks. He had several cabinets in his room containing specimens, and everything had been turned onto the floor and damaged more or less. In fact, although nothing had been taken, the damage was considerable. On the night of the burglary, Dr. Wood was away from home, only servants being in the house. The cook, suffering from face ache, had been restless all night, but had heard nothing. It seemed, however, that the burglar must have heard her moving about, and had been prepared to defend himself, for a revolver, loaded in every chamber, 
was found on one of the cabinets. Apparently, having put it ready for use, he had forgotten to take it away. The doctor was furious at the wanton destruction of his specimens, and being irascible and suspicious, fancied the revolver was merely a blind, and that the culprit was some jealous medical man. Again, there were cigarette ends among the debris. As soon as possible, I went to Quarles, and was shown into the empty room. The unexpected has happened, I said. No, no, the expected, he said impatiently, and he pointed to a heap of newspapers. I've read every report, but tell me yourself, every detail. I did so. The same brand of cigarettes? he asked. No, but all cheap American ones. One man trying to give the impression that he has several. You still think that? Nothing has happened to make you change that opinion? No, I hold to the one-man theory. And you are right, he snapped. I admit I might not have got upon the right track had you not made that discovery. It was clever, Wigan. It did not seem to help you to a theory, I answered. True, but it made me ask myself a question. Had the thief found what he was looking for? Much depended upon the answer. If he had, I saw a small chance of elucidating mystery. I might have propounded the theory, but I should have had no facts to support it. Indeed, had I theorized, then my theory would have been wrong. If the thief had not found what he wanted, he would continue his search, I argued. For some reason, he connected Sir Joseph Maynard with the object of his search, and when he tried again, we stood chance of finding the link in the chain we wanted. It might implicate Sir Joseph, it might not. That is why I said we must wait. The thief has tried again twice. Now, what is he looking for? Presumably something a doctor is likely to have, I said. And not silver, nor money, nor papers, nor... Nor counters, I suppose, I interrupted. Not precisely, said Quarles, but those counters have inspired me. They crept into my brain, Wigan, and remained there. Whatever it is the thief is seeking for, he is desperately anxious to obtain it, witness his two attempts on consecutive nights. You forget that days have elapsed since Sir Joseph's was broken into. Forget? Nonsense, said the professor sharply. Should I be likely to forget so important a point? It means that opportunity has been lacking. More, it means that any doctor would not do, only certain medical practitioners. And that is where the counters help me, or I think they do. How? Call for me tomorrow morning. We are going to pay a visit together. We may be too late, but I hope not. That revolver left in Dr. Woods's house rather frightens me. Why, particularly? It proves that the thief will use violence if he is disturbed, and that he is a desperate man. I should say he will grow more dangerous with every failure. It was like Christopher Quarles to raise my curiosity and then to leave it unsatisfied. It was his way of showing that he was my superior. At least it always impressed me like this. No man has ever made me more angry than he has done. Yet I owe him much, and there is no gainsaying his marvelous deductions. He made me angry now, first by his refusal to tell me more, and then by his patronizing air when I left the house. You are clever, Wigan, very clever. You have shown it in this case, but you lack imagination to step out as far as you ought to do. Cultivate imagination and don't be too bound up by common sense. Common sense is merely the knowledge with which fools on the dead level are content. Imagination carries one to the hills and shows something of that truth which lies behind what we call truth. I found him ready and waiting for me next morning, as eager to be on the trail as a dog in leash. We are going to call on Dr. Tressman in Montague Street, he said, stopping a taxi. You will tell him that you have reason to believe that his house is being watched and will be burgled on the first opportunity. If the opportunity is given, it may happen tonight, which will suit us admirably, because we have got to keep watch every night in his room until it is burgled. Of course, you will tell him who you are and get his permission. We don't want to have to commit burglary ourselves in order to catch the thief. Why do you expect this particular doctor will be visited, I asked. It is part of my theory, was all the explanation I could get out of him. Dr. Tressman was a man in the prime of life, and evidently believed himself capable of dealing with any thieves who visited him. I told him that the man we expected was no ordinary thief. A gang at work, eh? I have been out of town for a little while, holiday-making. Part of my holiday consists in not reading the papers. Of course you may keep watch, and I shall be within call, should you want help. You had better leave it to us, doctor, said Quarles, who for the purpose of this interview posed as my assistant. 
Come now, if it means a rough and tumble, I should back myself against you. Laughed Tressman, drawing himself up to his full inches. No lack of muscle, I can see, doctor, but then there is my experience. For all that, you may be glad of my muscle when it comes to the point, was the answer. At nine o'clock that night, Quarles and I were concealed in the doctor's room, Quarles behind a Chesterfield sofa in a corner, while I crouched close to the wall behind one of the window curtains. We had decided that the most likely means of entry was by a window at the end of the hall, and we expected our prey to enter the room by the door. We had got the doctor to put a spirit tantalus on the sideboard, also some biscuits and a box of cigarettes. We were anxious to reproduce the circumstances of the burglary at Sir Joseph Maynard's as nearly as possible, for Quarles declared it was impossible to say what significance there might be in the man's every action. So we waited, waited all night, in fact. Nothing happened. Something alarmed him, was all Quarles said when we left the house in the morning. He showed no disappointment, nor any sign that his theory had received a shock. The next night we were on the watch again, concealed as before. By arrangement, the house retired to rest early. So slowly did time go that half the night seemed to have passed when I heard a neighboring church clock strike one, and almost directly afterward the door of the room was opened stealthily and was shut again. Until that moment I had not heard a sound in the house, and I was not certain that anyone had entered the room even now until I saw a tiny disc, the end of a ray of light on the wall. The disc moved, so the man holding the lantern was moving. The next moment he almost trod upon me. His first care was to see that the curtains covered the windows securely, and it evidently never occurred to him that there might be watchers in the room. It was discovery from without that he was afraid of. The ray from his lantern swung about the room for a moment, then he switched on the electric light. As he had drawn the curtain closer across the window, I had arranged the folds so that no scrap of my clothing should show beneath them. Now I made a slit in the fabric with my penknife so that I could watch him through it. He was middle-aged, well-groomed, decently dressed. Having glanced round the room, he placed a bag and the lantern on the floor and went to the sideboard. He put a little spirit into one of the tumblers and added a little water, a very modest dose indeed, and having just sipped it, he poured some of the contents into two other glasses and placed the three glasses on a small table near the door so that no one could fail to see them on entering. Then he broke off a piece of biscuit, crumbled it in his hands, and scattered the crumbs beside the glasses. The cigarette box he did not touch, but he took some cigarette ends from his pocket and threw them on the floor. These preliminaries seemed stereotyped ones, and he appeared glad to be done with them. There was a curious eagerness in his face as he bent down and opened his bag, taking a thin chisel from it, and from his hip pocket he took a revolver. His method was systematic. He began at one corner of the room and opened every drawer and box he could find. If a drawer were locked, he pried it open. He laid the revolver ready to his hand upon the piece of furniture he was examining. Every drawer he emptied onto the floor. Some of the contents he hardly looked at. Indeed, most of the contents did not interest him. But now and then his attention was closer, and at intervals he seemed puzzled, standing quite still, his hands raised, a finger touching his head, almost as a low comedian does when he wishes the audience to realize that he is in deep thought. For some time I could not make out what kind of article it was to which he gave special attention, but presently noticed that anything in ivory or bone interested him, especially if it were circular. I remember the counters in Sir Joseph's room, and wished we had thought to place some in here to see what he would have done with them. Watching him closely, I was aware that he became more irritable as he proceeded. One small cabinet, which might possess a secret hiding place, he broke with the chisel, and I noticed that whenever a drawer was locked his scrutiny of the contents was more careful. He evidently expected that the man he was robbing would value the thing he was looking for, and would be likely to hide it securely. He had worked round half the room when he suddenly stopped, and with a quick movement took up the revolver. I had not heard a sound in the house, but he had. There was no sign of doubt in his attitude, which was of a most uncompromising character. He did not make any movement to switch off the light. He did not attempt to conceal himself. He just raised his arm and pointed the revolver toward the door, on a level at which the bullet would strike the head of a man of average height. The handle was turned, and the door began to open. The next five seconds were full of happenings. For just a fraction of time I realized that the burglar meant to shoot the intruder without a word of warning, and for a moment I seemed unable to utter a sound. Then I shouted, Back for your life! 
Immediately there was a sharp report. Quarles had fired from behind the Chesterfield, and the burglar's arm dropped like a dead thing to his side, his revolver falling to the floor. "'Quickly, Wigan!' Quarles cried. I had dashed aside the curtain, and I threw myself upon the burglar, just in time to prevent his picking up his weapon with his left hand. He struggled fiercely, and I was glad of Tressman's help in securing him, although the doctor had come perilously near to losing his life by his unexpected intrusion. But for Christopher Quarles, he would have been a dead man. We called in the police, and when our prisoner had been conveyed to the station, the professor and I went back to Chelsea. "'Do you know what he was looking for, Wigan?' Quarles asked. "'Something in bone or ivory.' "'Bone?' answered Quarles. "'Thank heaven that fool Trussman didn't come sooner. We might have missed much that was interesting. You noted how keen he was with every piece of bone he could find, how irritable he was growing. The counters, Wigan, they were the clue, but I did not understand their significance at first. I do not understand the case now, I confessed, except that we have caught a mad burglar. Yes, it's an asylum case, not a prison one, said Quarles. What was the man looking for? That was my first question, as I told you. If he had not found it at Sir Joseph's, he would look again. He did, and visited two other doctors. Round counters, doctors, there was the link. I dare say you know, Wigan, there is an annual published giving particulars of all the hospitals, with the names of the medical staff, consulting surgeons and physicians, and so forth. In the paragraph concerning St. James's Hospital, you will find that the first three names mentioned are Sir Joseph Maynard, Dr. Wheatley, and Dr. Wood. The fourth is Dr. Tressman. It could not be chance that the burglar had visited these men in exact order, so I argue that he would next go to Dr. Tressman. The man had something to do with St. James's Hospital, and since he was acting like a madman, yet with method, I judged he had been a patient who had undergone an operation, outwardly successful, really a failure. He was looking for something of which a doctor at this hospital had robbed him, as he imagined, and, not knowing which doctor, looked at this annual and began at the first name. I have no doubt he was conscious of the loss of some sense or faculty, and believed that if he could get back the something that was missing, he would recover the sense. Moreover, he was exceedingly anxious that no one should guess what he was looking for, so he attempted to suggest that a gang was at work, the glasses, the crumbs, the cigarette ends all placed where they would be certain to attract notice. Did you see how he touched his head several times tonight? Yes. That gives the explanation, I think, said Quarles. To relieve some injury to his head, he was trepanned at St. James's Hospital, and he was looking for the bone which the little circular trephine had cut from his head. I have no doubt he examined Sir Joseph's round counters very carefully to make sure that what he wanted was not among them, and he would naturally damage Dr. Wood's specimens. Probably the original pressure was relieved by the operation, but in some other way the brain was injured. We have seen the result. Subsequent inquiry at St. James's Hospital proved that Quarles was right. The man was a gentleman of small independent means, a bachelor, and practically alone in the world. There was no one to watch his goings and comings, no one to take note of his growing peculiarities. His madness was intermittent, but the doctor said he would probably become worse, as indeed he did, poor fellow. "'Ah, it is wonderful what surgery can do,' said Quarles afterward. "'But there are limitations, Wigan, great limitations.' And when we come to the brain, great heavens, we are mere babies playing with a mechanism of which we know practically nothing. No wonder we so often make a mess of it. 